Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back. It's good to see you guys. I really enjoyed the music. That was beautiful. <coughs> Last week I was gone. I was at a lay pastor training. Um, learned a lot of good things. Heard a lot of good speakers. We actually did a... Uh, uh, community service project, which worked out really well. I really enjoyed that. It's kind of funny, they took, uh, and there had to be 50, 50 of us, and everybody had on the red t-shirt. So this is up at Camp Kalakwa, and there's a woman in Winn-Dixie there, right? So 50 people get out of this bus. <laughs> the Army for Jesus Christ. <laughs> But what we did is um, we asked people we could clean their windshield to show them Jesus' love in a practical way. Um, they gave us permission. We did that for them. Um, we went in, and I like this idea. This is what I did. Is we had uh, $10 Walmart gift cards. And we went into the shops and gave them to the people working at the shops. So we just like to share Jesus' love in a practical way. We'd like to give you this Walmart gift card. And ask them, uh, they ask you, what? what? <laughs> Who are you people? And we ask them if there's anything we could uh, pray for them, a short prayer for them. And uh, everyone that I give a gift card to said, yes, please. Got to pray for people. Uh, there were two people specifically who told us things they were going through to pray specifically for that. It's a really good community service outreach. I really enjoyed that. Um, so, coming here this morning, and for the last week, I'm wondering, so what do I actually preach about this week? And um, I could finish Habakkuk, um, then I said, no, what I want to do is I want to ask you some questions and see what your answers are, okay? So, remember, this is going to be a dialogue, because if I ask a question you don't answer, I'm just going to stand here and look at you. <laughs> right? Yes. Well, I don't know. Where's it at? By the piano. Can you get that, Donald? First question that I'm going to ask, I just want to see a show of hands. <laughs> that is, how many here this morning have questions about their theology? or their relationship with God. Do you have any questions? If you do, raise your hand. I was kind of, so, so all you people that did raise your hands, you know your theology so well, there's never any questions about you and God? That's what that question is. Okay. Do you have any questions about your day-to-day -day theology, about how God works in your life, or if He's working at all? Okay. Then the next question is, is do you have any questions about your church's set of theology and doctrine? Okay? So I'm hoping that, because if you don't have questions, either you're really intelligent, or you're kind of cruising through your relationship with God on autopilot. Okay? Because I can tell you that in my relationship with God, I have questions every day. And what I've said before is what I've come to learn is the more you learn, the bigger your questions become. The more experience you have with God, the bigger and deeper your questions become. Because if I was able to explain God to you, He would no longer be God. I would be His equal. Is that right? So God in certain aspects is always going to be a mystery. And when you're talking about following a God that you don't see face to face, that you read about, that you have His Spirit living in you and you grasp insights, but you live in a sinful, fallen world if that doesn't raise questions to you, then again, you're just cruising and you're on autopilot. Okay. Anybody know what the title of this message is today? 
It's in your both. <laughs> Does it have to be one or the other? Here's a question for you. Does it have to be one or the other? I went to this program, and I go to these programs at least once a year, and most of the time what I hear is the love of Jesus a lot, okay? Is there anything wrong with the love of Jesus? No. But I hear the love of Jesus at the expense of the unique doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Does it have to be one or the other? Can you only either have the love of Jesus or the truth that is proclaimed by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? They go together. Hopefully it should be both, right? Now here comes the question, and hopefully some of you guys will have answers. How do you see that played out in your day-to-day -day life? Or how do you see it played out in the life of your church? Anybody? This is why Christianity is so weak. If you were to go back in the first century and ask that question, everybody would have an answer that quick. But we today have to think about that. And we today might not have an answer to that. Ricky, you had your hand up? John, you want to give him the mic? Hold on, he's coming. Yeah. How we deal with our day-to-day -day life is, is how we deal with each other. Okay. Um, we can show our love for each other or not. Right. I mean, I, even, I was talking in South School even about my little puppy. Mm -hmm. You can show the love of God by how you deal with even your little puppy. I agree with that. Uh, and that's a good answer. Uh, you should be able to see. Here, let me rephrase this question. Do you guys remember when you were teenagers? <coughs> Those of you that maybe are teenagers, you know what it's like to be teenagers. Okay, now, one of these things that this conference always does is they always inundate you with um, statistics. Okay, statistics, statistics. Well, it doesn't take a mathematician to realize that 14 to 28 year olds is a demographic that is very, very unrepresented. unrepresented Either. <laughs> There's not a lot of those people here coming to the church, right? Why do you think that is? And, and, and every executive, every theologian can give you an answer. But I'm going to ask you, why do you think that is? Anybody care to answer that question? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need you to raise your hand, fans, please. Okay, Mary Jane first. I was just thinking that in that age demographic that the world becomes more important to them than their eternal salvation. Okay. So basically it's their fault. No. 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 They don't know anything. See how you can, like I said, how depending on how you look at this, it comes up with whatever answers you can say what's the problem here. All of it? I think it's the great love of the family. Okay. All right. Um, that man right there? No, peer right. pressure. Peer pressure? Good. Well, I, the reason I left the church the first time around was the hypocrisy. Now, do you mind if I ask you a couple questions about that? What was it that you saw that you didn't like? Um, didn't see it being played out in people's real life. That goes back to the first question that I asked you. And that is, how do we, as professed followers of Christ, show Jesus' love in a practical way? 
not just one day out of the week, not when you come here, because we all put on our nice face when we come to church, is that right? We're on our best behavior. But what happens when we leave here? Okay? What happens when we're in our day-to-day -day life? And that's when Jesus should be seen more clearly. Okay, so let's continue to answer this question about that demographic age group. Why do you think they're missing? From the SCA church specifically? Yes, from the SCA specifically. It might not be as appealing. Okay, why? It might seem a little dry, not okay. too trendy. <laughs> yes, yes. And so you're here and you're um, not a teenager. Right? <laughs> but, but you are young. And so, why do you, why have you become a Seventh-day Adventist? I was, talk, I was talking to my wife about this, and uh, she, you know, we, um, she's, she's spoke, spoken about, um, you know, visiting other churches, going to the Flagler or something, and, you know, getting around a younger crowd, which I totally come down with, but um, I, you know, we're peculiar. I told her, you know, it's a good thing. It means we're special. So you see again, the question is, is does it... What's the title of this sermon? One way or the other. Does it have to be one way or the other? Now, some of these answers can be broken down into the difference between ideology whether you're conservative, whether you're liberal, right? Uh, younger people, you older people, how do you think they think? Do you think they're more conservative or more liberal? Don't, don't be ashamed to answer this question because this is going to help you think. I think the kids, the younger children nowadays are uh, invisible. They don't realize that a life could be over to today. And they aren't looking at the future. They're looking at, well, I have my future. It's still out there in front of me. So I can go out and, and do the things in the world. And then I can make up my mind and come back later. And I think that's what a lot of it is. The world is more appealing to our young children, our younger children, because of they think that they're invincible and they have a lot of time. Now, with the world being more appealing than the church, I would agree with that. But I don't think there's any difference between this generation and your generation. Your generation, when you were that age. When you were that age, what appealed to you more? The church or the world? The question is, is how does the church appeal to them more than the world? And this is where you get all these new programs. And this is where you get people who hear these programs who say, nah, not my church. Does it have to be one or the other? Now, think about the answers that you gave. Think about what you're thinking when you hear these questions. How would you, as an older congregation, appeal to teenagers. How would you get to bring them here? Not just one time, not just visiting, but so they stay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have four children aged 16 to 32. There you go. That's the age demographic. And I would have to say that we fail to cater to them. Mm -hmm. I've heard children say that when they're in a particular church, they don't like that particular music. Um, some of us may prefer the old time hymns, and maybe as we get a deeper faith, we tend to revert back to the old time hymns. But that may not appeal to our children. Respecting what Ellen G. White has taught us about music, and in keeping with that, it's a, a fine line. But do we cater to ourselves, or do we cater to the youth? That's a good question. Again, now see, that answer would come back to whatever your ideology happens to be, right? Because you're going to cater to what your ideology is. If you are on a more conservative uh, view of the world, then...
things that are done in your church are going to be more conservative. Is that right? And you're going to fear those things that may cater to a younger group. And you may fight against that. Does it have to be one or the other? Yes. We don't cater to a social class or an age group. Amen. We cater to God. Very good. The yeah. thing that, that I enjoyed growing up is being made a friend of the older people. In the church that I grew up in, in Titusville, the youth were just surrounded by the old people. And you felt their love. Oh, absolutely. You felt a part of the church. Come, go fishing with me. Come, help me build this house. Did you feel that they were genuine, or they were, as she experienced, the hypocrisy? I don't. I, there was no hypocrisy. So what the people you saw needed the house to be genuine. built. Yeah, they needed the house to be built. So come help me build the house. See, brothers and sisters, this is why I'm asking you these questions, because I guarantee you there are people here thinking about the answer she gave when you talk about having programs that would appeal to young people, that makes you feel very uncomfortable. I'll look around. How many young people you have come here on a regular basis? But there are also those who say, well, I'm in agreement with him. I'm not catering to anybody. What God has placed me here to do is to uplift the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm here to make converts for Jesus Christ. How do we do that with young people? Is to show them Jesus in a practical, real way, without hypocrisy. Meaning that what we say, we actually do. What you actually experience. Now, what you experience then, do you still see that happening in the churches that you go to? Yes, I do. <laughs> Amen for that. Amen. Because this is why it does not have to be one or the other. What I have seen in my experience, and I'm just talking to you now about my experience, because this is what I go home and think about, and wake up in the middle of the night thinking about and go to bed thinking about it. And that is, what am I doing here as a pastor? What agenda have I set for this church? We like to teach scriptural truth here in this church. Is that right? Yes. We also are not afraid to be called Seventh-day Adventists in this church. Is that right? I am not afraid to teach that we are a unique movement called out of prophecy specifically for a purpose. And that purpose is to prepare a people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. But how do we do that and all be on the same page? How can I make that message appeal to you at your age, Bob, you at your age, and these guys at their age? Janet? I remember back when I was in high school and I was in a church that was very nice, very nice people, but I was starving to death spiritually. And I decided when I was a teenager that when I got of age more that I would find a group of people that could help me, to guide me spiritually. And I, I found it in this church because I was able to truly learn about God and I was fed spiritually and pointed the right direction and through my years in this church I've been um, happy to know a few people that really, really knew God 
and I could see what, and they were beautiful people. They were people that had been changed by Christ. And I wasn't looking for music. I wasn't looking for a beautiful building. I wasn't looking for anything except, except God. Okay. And the depth of spiritual life. But let me ask you a question. The truth of the is, Bible. Is everybody looking for what you just looked for? Well, it says, the, the, it says that the, the gate is narrow. Only if you find it. it says the okay. is Here's narrow. the difference of how you're, whether you're going to be successful or not successful. And that is, raise your hands if you're in this age bracket of 13 to 19. Raise your hands. And look around. 13 to 19, look around. There is nobody here in that age bracket. So all we can do is we can say what we think they want, they're looking for, and we think what their life is about. Right? Here, give it back to John. So, unless you actually have that age group here, do you remember what it's like to be 15? But is it, is it as clear of a memory as a 15-year-old going through it today? What you went through at 15, is it what they're going through today at 15? This is why you have to have Jesus Christ in your heart. Because Jesus would, could relate to anybody in any position at any age. Now let me ask you, how well would you handle a conversation with a prostitute working out on the street? Would you? <laughs> you would do well. Because I know. But if your clientele stepped through this door and came in dressed the way they go to work, would the rest of you people here be willing to accept them? You're supposed to, but will you? See, because what you're supposed to do and what you're thinking is usually two different things. And this is what I found out about my own experience. John? I was going to point out that. Uh, and we're getting ready to transfer it to this church, and I was given a piece of paper to put my information on here, but no one asked for the cell phone number or the email address. And as a young person, that's how they communicate. That's right? how they communicate. So if you want to get to them, you want to blast out the YouTube of the service they need to them if they want it, or signs of the times in the email address because they don't read books they don't i mean if they, it's not on their tablet then you know it's not getting to them so you got to communicate on their on their level, level. And, and what we have to do because there's nobody here in that age bracket so what all of us have to do is try to see their world through their eyes now ken how old are you 30. You guys remember when you were 30? I remember when I was 30. That was 20-some uh, years ago. We're talking two decades. So your world today at 30 is totally different from my world at 30. So Kenton, what do you look for in a church to worship God at 30 years old? What are you looking for? The thing that's always drawn me to the Seventh Day Adventist Church is the love. And people seem to be really genuine. I've always experienced that anyway. Amen. Um, I've never been.